we've all been sitting here for a long time, so I'm going to wake you guys up. So we're going to catch, catch, <laughs> catch. Nobody's catching. Catch, way in the back. All right. Is everybody awake? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> it's, a, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, we'll get right into this. First of all, what I'm going to be talking about is on a website called CPR360. And it's CPR360.org. It's a bunch of small, short um, videos that talk about what we're talking about here today, improving care in, in CPR. And it's for attention spans like mine, very, very short, so you can watch them really, really quickly, and you can help train your, your organization. So anybody that's interested in that, it's free. Free service. So CPR360. I'm from the Mesa Fire Medical Department. Recently we changed our name. The medical part was never a part of it. We've been doing medical EMS for 30 years, but we have never recognized it in our name. Um, so we finally recognize that 85% of what we do is EMS, and about 3% is fire. <laughs> so we're squirting water on, on fire is only about 3%, so now we're recognizing that. I think someday it will be the base of medical and fire department, but <laughs> firefighters are going to find us on that. So. We are a fire based EMS system, so when you call 911, in the United States we call 911, um, you get a fire truck first in most communities, okay, especially in ours. So we have 20 fire stations, about 40 responding units. We do hazmat, TRT, um, all, this, all the specialty stuff that we do. We have about 500,000 residents in the city of Mesa. Uh, we are a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona. And we're pretty, we're basically a large city, nothing like Seoul or anything like that. We have about one cardiac arrest a day. Last year we had 424 cardiac arrests. So, does anybody recognize you guys can't? Yes. Does anybody know these two? Who are they? You know their names? You know what show, TV show they're from? What is it? Ice Cube. Not close. Hey, teacher, I want to give it away. <laughs> what is it? Rescue. All oh, close. Yeah. It's emergency. Emergency. For your guess. <laughs> Thanks for guessing. Right. Hey. <laughs> this is. This was a show in the 1970s when EMS really started in the United States. This is Johnny and Roy, and it was a show called Emergency. It really started the interest in medical services. They were both paramedics, and, and they're talking on a big phone here to the hospital. We used to think in my organization that <clears throat> you know, we'd go and do a code, someone would be in cardiac arrest, and we'd go and do it for the family, but we really didn't save a whole lot of people. We were Say to maybe 3%, 5%, something like that. So we kind of had a feeling that this is kind of useless. We'll just go ahead and do it and, and put on a good show for the family. And every once in a while, we save somebody. We switched that mentality to say, we should be saving more and more of these people. So when we don't, we say, why didn't we save this person? Okay. So EMS, you guys have seen that this is the real chain of survival. Um, we're going to concentrate just on the, the EMS portion. But you need the whole system to actually be able to save these people. Our mindset on the Mesa Fire Department and Medical Department is ventricular fibrillation is a savable rhythm. It really is. And we'll show you. But we've got to do some very good things. We've got to do very good CPR, and we'll talk about that. We use a synergy, what we call minimally interrupted cardiac resuscitation. It's MICR, which what we use is hand only CPR. We don't do any breaths for eight minutes, and I'll show you the other one here in a second. High quality CPR. We use real time CPR feedback on our monitors to show us how we're doing. We use a pit crew method, and we'll go over all these things, and then we do our quality improvement at the end. Using these methods, we've improved our cardiac save rates by 2.72 times. And I'll show you the numbers at the end. 
little suspense at the end here. I don't want anybody to think, well, we're not a Firebase DNS system, and we don't have the fancy gadgets, and we don't have this, so we can't improve. You can. Okay? If we would have thought that we couldn't improve when we started, then we would still be where we were. So it's definitely worth trying. Okay? Pick the equipment that works for you. Pick the methods that work for you. Okay, everybody's situation is a little bit different. So this all started back in 2004. We never measured before. So we were saying at about 3%. Okay? And Dr. Ben Bravo, which I think he's been here and talked uh, in years past, he said, with so few survivors, we felt compelled to make modifications of protocol. In other words, we're not saving that many. We can't do anything but help. Okay? So what we did statewide in Arizona was we implemented a CCR protocol. We called it cardiocerebral resuscitation, or CCR at the time. And this is hands-only CPR for professional rescuers. We do eight minutes. So two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, and two minutes. Or 200 compressions, because we're doing them at 100 compressions per minute. We give only epinephrine. We don't give any of the other drugs until after. And then we transfer into ACLS guidelines. So then we would transfer into the 30 to 2, give amyotin and those kinds of things. Okay. So we would, after 200, we check and see if we could shock. If we can, we shock them. If not, we're back on the chest, pound them away. Okay. And the only thing that we do for airway was we do an OPA and an on rubber and a mask. And I think we really do that just because we, we think we got to do something. So that's what we do. Okay. So just by implementing this protocol in Arizona, this is what we did. We almost tripled our save rates just by doing MICR. Okay? So you can see 9.2% from 3.6 to 28.1 from 10.9 for witness feed fill. Okay? And that was the only thing that really changed. We didn't talk about high quality CPR, we didn't talk about CPR feedback, we didn't talk about PICRU method. Why do we think hands-only CPR works? It keeps the blood pressure where it needs to be to perfuse the brain. And I'll show you on the next slide why that's important. It keeps us from, the first thing a paramedic wants to do when they get on the scene is, oh, I gotta get the tube, I gotta get the tube in. Well, the tube's not saving them, it's the compressions that save them. So we're delaying in, air, in airway interventions and we're not bagging them to death, okay? So this is traditional CPR. We do 30, and then we give two breaths, and 30, and then two breaths. In the time it takes to give the two breaths, the blood pressure drops significantly, and then we got to start all over again. It takes a good 15 to 20, or 25 good, hard, fast compressions to get that blood pressure back to where it needs to be. So right when we get it there, it drops off. So this is hands-only CPR. We bring it up, and we get it up there, and we keep it up there. Okay. There's enough oxygen in the blood, we just have to circulate it around. In a, in, a, in a victim of sudden cardiac arrest. Now there's other reasons for cardiac arrest that don't apply to this, and I'll show you that here. So, we entered into a trial with the Zoll Medical Corporation, the University of Arizona, and the Department of Health Services. And it started with the feedback device here, we call it the puck. Okay, or the hockey puck. We do CPR on this puck, and it's part of the defibrillator pads. Okay? You might have seen them already, and Zola isn't the only one who makes this. Okay? So all we did for the first phase of this was we did CPR on the puck. We didn't do any training, we didn't do anything. So we were taking in data. We did that for about 18 months. Okay? Then we did a bunch of training with our members. We did in-person training, crew-based training, so we brought the crews in as they are out there in the field, the people that they work with, the teams that they work with, and we trained them. Okay, So we taught them high-quality CPR, the pick-crew method, and real-time CPR feedback. So, recognize this? <laughs> this was kind of the basis. There was a study done in San Diego um, in the hospital, and they said, if we do really good super CPR, we, we don't do any of the pauses that we typically do in the field, we are saving a ton more people. So that's what we kind of base it on. Now, 
the first phase where we just did CPR on the puck, we didn't have any of the, the CPR feedback. These were our numbers. Our average rate was 128 per minute. Our depth of compressions was only 1.78 inches, which is less than five centimeters. Okay. But look at our pauses, 27 second pre-shock pause and 40 second post-shock pause. We're off the chest for almost over a minute, for a minute and seven seconds. Okay, so what's that doing to a heart that's not beaten? Nothing. Okay, our compression fraction was only 66%. So, needless to say, we didn't think that was very good. So, we would have went into CPR competition with anybody out there. We thought that we were that good, but we never measured, so we never knew. Okay? So, kind of took us down a couple notches. So, when you're training, we need to, there's the new consensus statement out, it came out last summer, and if you're not familiar with it, take it. It's a good, it's an easy read, it's not like stereo instructions or anything like that, it's really easy to read. Um, these are the five things that they talk about that we need to train, and these are the things that we train our members in. Okay. Compression rate fraction, so during the code, you have to be doing compressions most of the time to make these people survive. The rate, the exact rate is not known, the rate's between 100 and 120. So if you're in there somewhere, you're, you're good. The depth needs to be over 5 centimeters. Okay. We shoot for 2.5 inches on ours, so you'll see that. And then chest recoil, we actually have to come up off the chest a little teeny bit every compression to be able to let that chest fill back up with blood. And then the ventilation rate. We were finding that we were ventilating at over 30, 36 times per minute, and we we're having very, very poor survival. Okay. So it says do a pit crew or some sort of choreographed team resuscitation. Okay. Don't stop compressions for advanced airway placement. So our guys, at the end of the eight minutes, they can innovate if they elect to, and, but we don't stop compressions. They get one chance at it, and then we use, we use a king airway as our supervised airway. Okay. We don't do pulse checks. We minimize the pauses. It's either shockable or it's not. We used to sit there and look at the monitor and say, what do you think? Is that shockable? Yeah. But it's, it's either shockable or it's not. 18% decrease in survival for every five seconds around the shocks. Okay? So if you're sitting there watching the monitor, you, either, you have to make a decision or not. Either you're shocking it or not. You're not. Get back on the chest. Okay? CPR feedback. This is from the consensus statement. It says with the technology, technology that's come out, we've got to be doing this now. All the manufacturers of the heart monitors make this technology now, so it's available, it's out there, and it says you should be incorporating to every resuscitation. This is for professional rescue. This is what our dashboard looks like on our monitor. So you can see... So this one right here, this is our dashboard. It tells you the depth, and this is in inches. It tells you the rate. If you're not within the rate, it gives you a little red light, okay, which means it's not good. It tells you how long we're in our two-minute timer. It counts down from two minutes. This bar here, we want it to look like this. We want it full. That means you're fully releasing. If it's halfway, you're not releasing enough. And then we're in the PPI, which is the simulation of the heart. If it's full, the heart's full of blood. Okay, so that's what we're seeing right when we're doing CPR. And what that has done for us is this was a resuscitation when we didn't have the feedback. The blue lines are compressions, the yellow is the background, we're not doing any compressions, so we have a lot of pauses. We weren't hitting our depth here, and you can see our rates all over the place. Once you turn that on, everything is just like driving at night with your headlights off, and then you turn the lights on, you're able to see. I'm going to skip, I'm running a long time here. So, the pit crew method. Each person has a role, they don't interfere with each other, they know what they're doing. Okay? So everybody knows what the other person needs to do and they don't get in their way. 
Um, we change compressions every two minutes because the two minutes is about the time where we start to see on the, on the uh, feedback where our compression quality goes down. Okay, so even our firefighters who work out 24 hours a day and are very, very strong, will see their performance go down. Okay. The importance of QA it is that the Heart Association is saying that this is as important as epinephrine right now, and it's going to move up. So I know on a code, I would never not get epinephrine. This is something that we need to do after every single cardiac arrest. We need to review them as a crew. How did that go for you? What could we have done better? Could we have done anything faster? Those kind of things. So here's the study that we were involved in. The influence of scenario-based training in real time. Um, very long name. Very long name. Okay. And here's where our outcomes were. By integrating these three things, we went from a 26% witness shockable rhythm rate to 55.6. Okay. And then all rhythms, we went from 8.7 8 to 13.9. This is just the hospital dis discharge. Now, this is a lot, the number that we're looking for. Okay. We don't want to bring them into a vegetative state. We want them to go home to their families and go home to school. So this was the numbers here. So this is a cerebral confusion category score of one or two, and we're at about the 46% range. Okay. Now that study was a couple of years ago. This is what we've done in the last, comparing the year to year. Now our, sorry, our, Witness to fib survival rate has gone down just a little bit, but our all witness, we're seeing less and less V fib and more PEA, more asystole, but we're able to save a little bit more of those, which is good. And then this orange bar here is our state average. So we're well above the state average. Okay. So the takeaways incorporate high quality CPR. Make sure you train your people what that looks like, what it means, why are these components, the rate, the depth, the compression fraction, why those are all important. You've got to impart that to your crews. Use real-time CPR feedback so you can see exactly what you're doing. You're not guessing at it anymore. And use a pick crew method so you're not getting in each other's way. You can maximize that compression fraction. And then you have to follow it up with QA and the briefing at the end. I want to thank you guys for everything that you do. Do you have any questions for me? You guys still awake? All right. If you have any questions, you can. The best way to get me is on email. Yes. So you know, uh, in your system, right? There's a lot of people coming in around the cardiac arrest. First responder, fire engine crew, special paramedic response. So what is the role of the paramedic, you know, and you know, basically what you have is a mass therapy for the people, people living around all over the place, right? And how do you get them to have the philosophy of, you know, working as a team and getting things organized? So the, the pit crew, are you talking about just cardiac arrest? Yeah. Yeah, so on a cardiac arrest, we have a four-person crew, two EMTs, two paramedics. And then we have an ambulance crew that comes, and that's one paramedic and one EMT. Um, the pit crew method has really helped. So everybody knows the roles. The two EMTs are, are doing the compressions and they switch off every two minutes. One paramedic is running the code. One paramedic is delivering the drugs. So we, we start an interosseous sign in the tibia, or we can even do it in the humeral head of the uh, shoulder. Um, and we give epinephrine, and that's the only time that we do it. So everybody knows their role, and then once the two paramedic or the paramedic and the EMT come in from the transport agency, we incorporate them in to compressions. Um, but it's that main paramedic that is running the code, making sure that everything's going as we are supposed to go. They're more of a coach. Hey, you're doing a great job. Hey, you're in the red zone on your compression depth. Let's start pushing a little harder, or do you need to switch out? Let's switch out. Okay. Did I answer your question, Marcus? Yeah. Okay. And, yes, sir. Yes. question. There is often that uh, when people think that uh, that CCR or CCR means almost the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that maybe a misconception is certainly not wrong. You do ventilate your patients, and I think you give more uninterrupted chest compression. Very good. 
you mm -hmm. compress it about 200 over two minutes. Mm -hmm. And after that, you would do bank mass meditation. Do you know? No. You don't use so, data. So for the first eight minutes, for the first eight minutes when we get there, all we do is compression. So we do an OPA and a non rubrigo mask, and that's it. And then they do need some ventilation after that. But our studies are showing that but you do a passive passive ventilation. But we don't bag them at all. Even though you have six people around. Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to interrupt the chest compressions to give the ventilation. Because we want to keep that blood pressure at that high high rate to give us reduce the brain. With our average, I'm trying to think of the numbers, I think it's from dispatch call to by the patient side is about eight to nine minutes. So we go eight to nine minutes, and then so if nobody's doing CPR in our system, if a bystander isn't doing CPR, the likelihood of saving that patient is very, very low. See, we, we did some data collecting many years ago in Marcus lab that study, mm -hmm. and we found that for the average, the time to collapse, the time when at the end of school, to be able to start CPR on the patient will be five minutes. Right. And that's because we have what, what we tend to reaction time to the part of the, of the, of the caller, the best to go to traffic, uh, traverse the high rise building, and stuff like that. Um, so, in an environment where it takes on the average, about 20, 20 to 25 minutes for ambulance to reach the time. And here I'm talking about time from arrest, not time right. from call. Right. Would you recommend that uh, meditation not be provided in the long downtime? Yeah, I think you have to. The evidence that we're seeing on, on the oxygen that's in the blood that just needs to be circulated is only between 10 and 15 minutes. It's only there available. So you need to be circulating and ventilating. Correct. Okay. So I think when we look at evidence, there's some very good evidence, some very good work that you're doing, which shows that uninterrupted just compressions is good. Mm -hmm. yeah, but at some point, uh, oxygen becomes oh, absolutely. Yes. And therefore, when you translate evidence into practice, you have to look at the, the environment in which you are translating the evidence. Right. Uh, and and mm -hmm. so we call it CCR. Not only CPR, but also CCR, because it also starts to get the brain, uh, so there's really no difference. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have a knowledge of the move. Sure. But, but I think the message we must get people is that in environment, long downtime, some form of ventilation would be important. Right. But your message is that good CPR, good quality CPR is very important. Mm -hmm. Minimal interruption mm -hmm. with CPR is very important. The challenge is how can we deliver uninterrupted CPR to yet provide some kind of ventilation? I think in an environment with long right. I think you guys are able to use LMAs, correct? You pop an LMA in when you first get there, and you, one person is bagging, the other person is doing compressions, and you just minimally pause to get that breath in while you're doing the CPR. That's my best guess. Without any um, studies to back that up. <laughs> but that's what I would do if that was nice. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.